Thanks everybody for coming. I'm Joe Robinson. I'm the organizer of Designers and Geeks. Uh, how many of you are here for the first time tonight? Awesome. Wow. Thanks. Lots of good new people to meet. So, uh, very excited for tonight's talk. Before we jump into that, though, I just want to give you a little overview of the event and uh, also introduce some folks that make it possible. Um, so basically, we start uh, with the networking and the pizza, and uh, then we'll go into the talk. Uh, so tonight we have uh, Mike Kuniewski. Um, and uh, can you hear me? OK, thanks. Thanks for the heads up. Yep. Um, and uh, we go into the talk, which usually lasts about half hour, 45 minutes. And uh, from there, uh, after that, we have a segment called Shout Outs. Uh, basically, you can come up here, I will give you one of these microphones, and you can say something that you'd like to network about or people you'd like to meet, that sort of thing. So be thinking about that. That's right after the talk. Um, and after that, we have the space until about 9 p.m., and there's uh, plenty of beer, plenty of pizza, as you saw over there. So please uh, enjoy yourselves. Um, so just want to say a quick thank you to Yelp. Um, they're awesome. They host us. Uh, they make this possible. So uh, this is Allison from Yelp. Let's give her a quick round of applause. Hi, guys. I'm Allison at Yelp. I, uh, I'm a UI designer on the consumer product team. Um, we focus on designing and managing all of the features that are up on Yelp.com and also in our mobile apps. As I like to tell people, we uh, focus on pixels and milliseconds. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, definitely excited for this particular talk and all the designer and geek events. Um, there are plenty of us Yelp engineers and designers uh, roaming around here, so if you have any questions or want to know more about us, feel free to approach any single one of us. And if you haven't already, check out the swag table up at the front. Cool. Thanks. Thanks again to Yelp. Um, so uh, basically, uh, tonight's talk is uh, from Mike. Um, he'll be talking about uh, the new product development ecosystem. Uh, very excited for this talk. Um, is uh, Sophie in the audience? She introduced us. So thank you very much for introducing me to Mike uh, and making this possible. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. All right. I've, I've got the. Cool. Thank you. Let me uh, swap presentations. Uh, da -da 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 -da. All right, so uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Joe, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, so uh, as soon as I saw the logo for this event, I knew I had to participate. <laughs> I, I can't imagine why I had not known about it before. Uh, so <laughs> thank you very, uh, very much. So um, Joe, uh, 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 Joe gave the title of my talk. Um, I will jump into it uh, in a minute. First, I want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, so. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a user experience designer, and uh, um, you know that title has changed m multiple times over the years. But uh, I was one of the first professional web designers in uh, 1993, so that was 19 years ago. And uh, um, you know, whatever, I'm old school. I was there before the image tag. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to be uh, present at the birth, uh, uh, like in the building, uh, the birth of the shopping cart and the search engine, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is the navigation for a hot sauce shopping site I designed in 1994. Uh, I am showing you this because uh, I'm really proud of the fact that 16 years later, they were still using the same identity. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, the oldest pixels on the internet at the time. I think they've since rebranded. Um, Here's uh, one of my UI designs for the advanced search for Hotbot, the this, uh, this search engine. It's an early search engine. This was from 1997. If you ever wonder why Google's front page is so minimal, I think it's because we did this. Um, and since then, I've consulted on the UX design of, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds of websites. Here's one for uh, credit.com, who were a fantastic client a couple of years ago. Um, I uh, sat out the first dot-com crash uh, writing a book based on the research work I've been doing. It's a cookbook of user research methods. It came out in, thank you, it came out in 2003. Uh, and the second edition, which was uh, edited uh, and revised and, uh, with 80% new content, roughly speaking, uh, by Elizabeth Goodman, came out about two weeks ago. So there's a second edition of this. Uh, buy a copy for everyone on your team. Uh, and for your friends. Uh, so in 2001, I co-founded a design and consulting company called Adaptive Path. Um, 
And then uh, in 2004, I had been working nonstop on the web for 11 years, and I was really tired of it, so I left Adaptive Path, and I uh, founded a company about a year and a half later with Todd Kurt called Thingum. And so Thingum is a micro OEM. So what does that mean? So um, we're essentially an R&D lab. We design and manufacture a range of hardware products. Uh, we call them smart LEDs. You can see some of our product line right there. Um, they are uh, uh, used by architects, industrial designers, hackers. Uh, since we're an OEM, we don't always know what people use them for, but we do know that they're used on uh, flying robots, that they're used in Lady Gaga's costumes, and uh, some other stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, so uh, that's kind of primarily what uh, uh, Thingam did. We also did a number of uh, interesting experimental projects. This was an RFID wine rack where, uh, that we did for Wired Next Fest about five years ago where uh, each bottle has RFID on it, uh, there's a reader in each cell, the cells display metadata from a faceted classification system that's up in the cloud, uh, such as current market price, and you can slice and dice along various facets. Um, this right here is a project that we did uh, a couple of years ago that is a um, capacitive sensing kitchen cabinet knob that glows when you touch it. Um, the idea here was, uh, both to uh, think about how to use this digital technology in a way that wasn't purely informational based, that was essentially purely decorative, and also to think about what would it take to make a digital hardware product that would last and be useful and interesting for 20 years. So that was kind of an experiment that we, uh, uh, that we did. Um, we did not manufacture either of these things, um, but um, we're pretty proud of them. So um, in 2010, I wrote a book on the user experience design of ubiquitous computing devices, because I'd been doing a fair amount of work in that space. As I said, I left the web behind. Uh, not entirely, but largely. And what I, def I define ubiquitous computing as things that do information processing and networking, but are not experienced as general purpose computing devices. Like a phone is still essentially a general purpose computing device, but a sidewalk that uh, uh, recognizes that has pressure sensors in it and has telemetry and potentially some kind of display is not a general purpose computing device and is not recognized as such, even though it uses digital processing and information technology. So I wrote a book on the, the UX design of that. Um, I also organize an annual summit of people who develop uh, hardware design products for non-engineers called Sketching and Hardware. Um, but uh, to wrap up you know, all about me, uh, Thingam and books and conferences are actually not my day job. They are entertaining and sometimes time-consuming sidelines. Um, my primary day job is as an innovation and user experience design consultant. Uh, these days, primarily focused on design of digital consumer products. Here are some products that I've worked on for Yamaha, for Whirlpool, for Qualcomm. Um, and in the last couple of years, I've kind of gone dark. And my, because my clients have been large consumer electronics companies where I've really helped them in advanced R&D uh, for their products and services uh, and helped them create perhaps somewhat more user-centered cultures. I can't tell you who they are. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that um, big data analytics, real-time image recognition, distributed processing, and machine learning are pretty awesome when applied to consumer products. I know, that means nothing. Uh, so this spring, I finally got to do a project I can talk about. I uh, worked with Siftio, which is a game company startup in San Francisco, to design all of the non-game user experience, uh, uh, almost going all the way out to the box, uh, and like essentially from the box, through the firmware to the website um, of their uh, second generation platform. It was a really uh, nice uh, project to work on. Uh, they announced it about a month ago. Uh, you can buy them now and they uh, will be under your uh, tree for Christmas. Um, so let me give you a prologue to the main part of this talk um, now that I'm done with my CV. Thank you for indulging me. Um, so the prologue to my main uh, 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 the main part of my talk is actually um, 
a little bit of history of manufacturing efficiency. I know that's what you really expected uh, <laughs> when you came here. So uh, this is kind of only barely a history because I'm not really a historian, but I've been reading, as I've been doing all this work with manufacturers and with manufacturing and with making physical products, digital physical products, uh, I've been reading a lot about the history of technology. And um, I came up with this model that I'm about to introduce to you um, to help me understand several trends in manufacturing. Um, like I said, I don't have a lot of data to, uh, to, uh, to back it up, but uh, I think it has some face validity. So let's start with, can you read that? Yeah. So this very broad idea. So uh, let's think about one unit of work. So how many things can you produce one unit of work? So you see kind of an interesting curve. So for most of the last 10,000 years, so starting with antiquity, um, uh, when you put one unit of work into a project, you got really kind of like, I'm using unit very broadly, one thing out of it, right? Um, so during this period, you saw some gains in efficiency, right? You know, this is like uh, uh, an order of magnitude ga a gain. You know, as people invented things like the potter's wheel, the plow, fire, right? Uh, uh, the, you know, they tamed horses. But those efficiencies were, re were really linear. So no one had the capability, if you like, look at Sumeria, or even like if you look at like, you know, the Middle Ages, no one had the capability to make 10,000 cooking pots in a day. Then this happens. In 1800, James Watt's patent on the improvement to Newcomen's steam engine expires. So James Watt uh, uh, got a patent from the crown in 1775 to give him exclusive rights to manufacture his somewhat more efficient steam engine uh, until 1800. Uh, what happens in 1800 is that uh, the patent expires. Boom. What you have is you have the Industrial Revolution. You have exponential growth in the efficiency of production. Suddenly, 10,000 cooking pots in a day is pretty easy. It's totally doable. And that's then followed by this kind of steady increase in efficiency until we get you know, roughly to uh, uh, today's industrial society. OK, so that's a fairly familiar thing. Now let's look at a related curve, which is the number of units of work necessary to make the first thing. So why, why the first thing? Because making the first thing when you're making something is really hard. You, you, know, you become uh, uh, efficient later, but the first time you make a thing, it's really difficult. You, know, you have to uh, master all of the design uh, constraints. And for most of history, that is totally flat. <laughs> you know, that is totally flat. You have this thing where like, OK, you know, the first time I put one unit of work into it, you know, the first time I make a pot, you know, say it's 500 years ago and I'm an apprentice. The first time I make that thing, I get to make one. You know, the, uh, uh, then I make a slightly different one. Well, it's really hard and I have to uh, spend the same amount of effort and I, and I, and I, and I get one. So, um, but the funny thing is that the Industrial Revolution didn't make that easier. It made it much harder to make the first thing. It made it much, much harder to make the first thing. Mass-produced objects are really complex. They require you to make tools that make tools that make the end product. You know, it's no longer a process that a single person or even a small workshop can do using the time, you know, in terms of time, money, and energy. Um, it requires expertise and, you know, and this is essentially our familiar experience of manufactured products. You pick nearly anything that you see or you have and it's almost impossibly complex for you to make one. You yourself to make uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an entire one. It's almost impossible. That was actually not the case in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, you could make one of just about anything you saw. But now you can't because it's uh, orders of magnitude more complex. And then this thing happens. In October 2009, Stratasys uh, Corporation's core patent on computer-controlled additive manufacturing expires. Boom. The cost of making the first thing using additive manufacturing, that's what maker bots are, right, uh, plummets, while the cost of making lots of things stays the same. So, the relationship between these two things, you make the first one and you make lots, is where 
this enormous explosion in design and productivity is about to happen. So let me uh, uh, talk about that now. So imagine Amazon eight years from now. It looks like this. You know, I've designed the Amazon from eight years from now. <laughs> you know, it was really a, a challenging weekend. So uh, yeah, yeah, it looks exactly like the Amazon today. You know, it has essentially all of the same familiar ways to discover new products, to compare them, to see what people think about them, you know, to see what goes with what. So it has wish lists and gold boxes and you know, whatever, the whole thing. But there's a crucial difference. Instead of the Amazon being the end of a fulfillment system, as it is today, the Amazon of 2020 is the front end to a set of factories. The back end no longer looks like UPS. Instead, it looks like Ford Motor Company. And when you click on buy, you are starting a manufacturing process at the factory nearest you instead of a delivery process from a warehouse far away. So I know what you're thinking. Some of you who've been around this stuff. Mike saw MakerBot and got all excited. You know, we heard all this before. It's called mass customization, and it never worked out. Somehow, you know, they were talking about it in the 90s, and somehow it never worked out. Why talk about it again? Because I think that the 90s version of the presentation of mass customization as configurators for everything, everyone's a designer, you know, this is the uh, 1998 version of Levi's, uh, Le uh, Levi's project in this, um, really misses a core point of the user experience. You know, they, it really gets the user motivation wrong. Most people don't want to be designers. You know, they don't want to design everything. They want to just design the things they love, a couple of things. And they want to be consumers of the rest. You know, some people, of course, are going to make their own clothes. And some people are going to make their own cars. But those people are probably not the same people, right? Um, most people, you know, have better things to do than to figure out what colors go with what and, you know, uh, how much firmware will fit into an onboard memory of an embedded microprocessor, right? You know, they're, they're, they're busy. Um, they want professionals. Um, they want someone who's really fluent in the tools to do it for them. All right. So then you're just like, oh, you're talking about desktop manufacturing. I need a thing. I press a button. The thing appears, you know, okay, I don't design it, but it appears on my desk. No. As much as all of us geeks want a Star Trek replicator, <laughs> it's not really that useful in practice. You know, we just don't need that much new stuff all the time. You know, think about the replicator you already have, your laser printer or your inkjet printer. You know, they're pretty useful because they uh, essentially, you know, somewhat useful, but because they represent this kind of like high density information uh, uh, that fits into a kind of a rich existing culture of information use, right? You know, uh, there, there, there's a place within a culture that a piece of paper fits in order for it to make sense as an, as an object and why you would want to print a new one. But you know what? You don't use that thing very often. Like, uh, like uh, outside of work, you probably spend a lot more time on e-commerce sites than you do with your printer. Like, it's just not that... Uh, 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 not that valuable of a uh, capability to have at the leaf nodes, at the endpoints that the people are using it. You know, people are probably going to just be shop, uh, going to continue to shop. So, you know, basically, I think that both mass customization and desktop fabrication do this thing where they imagine a world that's really different than ours. You know, and I have nothing against envisioning new worlds and kind of working towards their creation. That's that's what I do for my clients. But my experience has taught me that creating new worlds and changing the behavior of millions of people is really hard. And it takes a really long time. If we look at a world eight years from now, odds are that it's not going to have changed all that much. You know, the odds are that uh, most of us are not going to uh, have a whole bunch more time on our hands to become mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and software engineers and material scientists. We're still going to be shoppers most of the time. So 2020 will look and work exactly like our world today when seen from the outside. It'll still be driven by the thrill of finding something awesome when you're board surfing the net and clicking and making it yours. The relationship between consumers and designers actually will remain quite similar. Designers will still be specialists in design. E-commerce sites will still help people find stuff, and people will still buy. Now, what's different? 
the crucial difference behind the scenes that turns this into this is this, is analytics. When you order from the Amazon of 2020, a counter is incremented that registers that you, a human being with a set of well-known behaviors that Amazon bought from Facebook and demographic <laughs> background, decided to buy this specific version of this specific uh, idea. Moreover, since the world of 2020 is a world of ubiquitous computing, the product that you get is a small bit of digital networked hardware that tracks how the product is used and with your permission sends that information back to a central server which um, aggregates, after anonymizing it, which aggregates uh, 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 the, the, the result. This is, of course, exactly how modern web design go, uh, works. This is exactly, I mean, this is all web design stuff that I'm showing you. It's exactly how modern web design works, but now we will be able to map it to all products. So when you have this combination of a rapid, cheap, distributed, low volume manufacturing capability, which we're rapidly developing in the wake of Stratasys' uh, patent expiration. And Stratasys has like, you know, a bunch of different patents and, and there's one expiring every year at this point because they, they patented all this stuff in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and you couple that with real time analytics, you have a profoundly new way of designing all products. You can take those industrial design uh, industrial age design processes, you know, the things that gave us, you know, different tail fins. You know, it took like years for the tail fin evolution to happen, you know, they bounced around and, you know, at some point they, you know, got, they, they went too far. <laughs> and everyone went, whoa, let's, 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 uh, uh, <laughs> ease off, GM. <laughs> um, but it took them years to test those hypotheses. Because each one of these is essentially a hypothesis about what the market will bear, or what, the, what people are interested in, or what the fashion is. Like each one of those, what we can do is we can take those processes and speed them up by orders of magnitude. And this kind of tight loop iteration between a market validation between an idea and market validation of that idea. This isn't a great slide. I'll tell you why this slide, slide is up there for that. But uh, between an idea and a market validation of that idea is the core of Eric Ries's lean startup approach, which many of you are probably quite familiar with. So this is a slide from Steve Blank, who's kind of the, uh, uh, the patron saint of lean startup. It kind of illustrates the basic idea, right? That you, know, you have some customers, you try to do some validation, and then you know, there's, he has a couple of other uh, steps in there. But the, that's the basic idea, is that you have an idea, you validate in the marketplace, you uh, change your uh, idea based on what you see, you have another idea, you validate in the marketplace, you change your idea based on what you see, and you do that, uh, and you try to do that in kind of the lightest way possible. I mean, I'm speaking, to, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure to the, uh, 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 to the choir about lean startups, but my point is that my, my, my vision, kind of my hypothesis, is that it's possible to do this with anything. It's possible to apply the ideas and practices that we developed for de designing and building stuff on the net to designing and building anything out in the world. So I want to go through a set of different um, kind of components of this and then kind of pull it all together at the end. Um, I want to start with the obvious the obvious one, which is um, low volume digital manufacturing. So this is the Form 1 printer that just uh, got funded through Kickstarter. Um, let's just assume that this, the thing that you can make, the thing that can make a, a random thing, either out of aluminum or out of steel or out of plastic or out of, uh, you know, whatever, meat. Uh, and there's a bunch of things out there that, uh, that have. Um, Let's assume that exists. Let's just ignore that. Like, everyone's talking about this part, like, ooh, MakerBots. Let's assume it exists. That's, that's to me, not the exciting part. I mean, it's, it's the, the thing that enables the exciting part, but it's not the exciting part. So the next piece of the hypothesis for me is uh, validating your idea. OK, so now you can make a small number of things. How do you validate this, uh, that small number? You know, how do you validate that idea without investing a lot in manufacturing a bunch, even, you know, with, with your MakerBots. Well, that component is rapidly coming online. So even though they sometimes deny it, Kickstarter is a catalog. It's a catalog for products that don't exist. 
what it does is if enough people want the product, it will come into being. And what that it does is that gives you feedback about the popularity of your idea, and it teaches you how to position it before you make a single one. So that allows you to test two kinds of hypotheses. Do people want your idea? And if they do, why do they want it? What do they want it for? And that is the kind of signal that you need when you're developing a product in order to understand what direction to take the product in. And if you do this in small steps, that's the point of Lean Startup, you avoid the kind of brittle initial assumption that a lot of products have where, oh, we have this set of uh, things that we're really sure people are going to do, and it turns out you're wrong. This is designed to avoid that. Kickstarter and things like Kickstarter are starting to give you an ability to do that, ability to float those ideas out there in order to be able to uh, get a, a signal back. So even Etsy allows you to have um, small run electronic products, I'm assuming as long as some part of it is made out of felt. <laughs> um, Fab.com, which you know I kind of associate with, I don't know, um, I don't know, leather backpacks. I don't know. I think, I think, I think, that, I think that's 90% of their business. I don't know. So yes, even fab.com sells uh, a limited uh, uh, edition small run electronics. You know, here's a new store that's opening on Valencia between, uh, it's, well, it's going to open like in a month, and it is between the 18th and 19th, 19th and 20th, something like that. Yeah, something like that, uh, called Digital Fix. It's a New York-based boutique, uh, boutique that specializes in limited-run electronics. They're opening their San Francisco office. So these channels that I just described that um, uh, for selling these products, these channels are immature, but they're becoming increasingly popular. In effect, what's happening is that they're doing an end run around, the traditional, uh, around traditional consumer electronic sales channels. At the same time, the digital fix, this tiny little boutique that sells uh, expensive headphones and, uh, uh, and the turntables and kind of awesome things that there may be only like a thousand of in the world. At the same time, the, the digital fix is clearly doing well enough that they have like two stores in New York and they're opening up one in San Francisco. Best Buy is dying. You know, Best Buy is withering on the vine. So these sales channels are doing an end run around traditional uh, uh, ways that things are, are, are selling. And I, simultaneously, they're giving developers direct access to their customers so they can test hypotheses. So they can test hypotheses directly with people. So this is now starting to bring, you know, in small, like, you know, I, I'm not saying the digital fix is the, uh, digital fix is the be all and end all. It's, I think, one indicator of the fact that product sales, that physical product sales and physical manufacturing is becoming closer to what we have learned to do deploying software on the web. So to me, the key missing piece, the key piece uh, that, I, that I think is about to kind of blow wide open and is a really amazing opportunity for those of you who want to start companies, um, is to uh, the, the thing that we still need to borrow from software is deliberate uh, distributed collaboration tools. So to make better hypotheses, we need to be able to take advantage of people's specialized skills, all different kinds of engineering that go into these things, kind of perhaps even wherever they are, so remotely, and to work together to create a shared understanding of what it is that we're making, to create a shared hypothesis of what it is that we're trying to do. The web, it's taken a long time for the web to develop these tools, uh, to, de to uh, develop ways for people to uh, negotiate and discuss what it is that they're trying to do and how to present that, and to build tools that support that. So here, here's, here's some, and I, I'm actually not going to talk about these. Uh, uh, I, I, I threw them over very quickly. Here, here's some. Uh, tools for uh, essentially very rapidly prototyping electronics. So this is just the this is from my sketching and hardware thing. But 
you know, right now for the web stuff, we have things like GitHub, Basecamp, WebEx, Balsamic, whatever. You know, um, but the physical world is way behind. Like if any of you have ever done any kind of commercial CAD stuff, you know, whoa, those things are huge and they're incredibly difficult. You know, SketchUp is kind of the beginning part of it, especially when you have collaboration. Like none of them have collab. Like when they have collaboration, it's, it's abysmal. You know, product lifecycle management systems, which are the way that you keep track of where your product is essentially base camp from uh, manufacturing. Product lifecycle systems essentially assume that you're always building an airliner. Like they're the worst. Uh, uh, you know, they're insanely complex. Um, we're getting new tools, but this is, I think, where the, uh, there's this really interesting opportunity. You know, Autodesk's 123D is starting to do some of this stuff. Pinoco, if any of you have uh, used Pinoco, it's actually awesome. Uh, it is not actually a collaboration tool. It is actually uh, more like a manufacturing tool. Uh, it's actually not even, it's, it's more like a factory that you can uh, make stuff with. Um, think about, I don't know, a Kinko's for laser cutting and 3D. You send them a thing. They make it for you, they send it to you. But you can also put up a design and have some, uh, someone else make that design for them and then they uh, can get the thing sent to them. Or you can take someone's design, you can buy it from them and you can modify it and put it back and, ha and have, it, uh, have it made. So they're starting to get their thingiverse. You can kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's MakerBot's uh, essentially repository of, uh, of stuff. You know, they, they, they can, uh, you can do stuff there. You can kind of fork projects there. But all these tools are really immature. I think uh, the most interesting one uh, is Sunglass, uh, which uh, started out as essentially a shared online CAD system, and they just pivoted. Uh, literally, like two weeks ago, they pivoted to being GitHub for 3D. So they're really thinking about what it means to have a 3D collaboration tool. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what's, uh, 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 what they do. Um, however, they're still super, all these products are super mature. When they mature, it's gonna really blow things open. That's gonna take time. You know, if you think about the kind of the culture of development, GitHub is the end point of an evolutionary practice that began for those of you who are old school geeks with make files, right? It started with Make and it's ended up with GitHub. That took like 25 years. It took 25 years to develop a development culture that understood what its problems were in, uh, in order to build tools to solve those problems. You know, you, you have, you can talk about a, a bunch of different uh, 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 kind of endpoints along the way, SourceForge, IDEs, things like that. Okay, so let me kind of roll a bunch of this stuff together and, we, uh, and kind of wrap it all up. In a, um, uh, in a way. <laughs> so to me, this is kind of how the whole ecosystem looks like. Not, not, not this, that's what it looks like right now. Uh, um, and, and I apologize in advance, there's gonna be like 17 buzzwords here. Um, so the first part is digital fabrication. So we all know what this is. It allows us to make different kinds of things in small batches. Many things, small batches, different materials, rapidly, rapidly developing, becoming cheaper. Ubiquitous computing slash the Internet of Things, leading to everyday objects that send streams of telemetry when we bring them home. Um, they have an information shadow, what I call an information shadow, up in the cloud. You know, they, they're, they're, they're directly connected up to the cloud. And that shadow can be data mined. Data mining, big data analytics. It crunches all that data to, uh, uh, to uh, create information about both what people want, but also uh, 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 kind of how the products fit in there. Like there used to be this, well, it still is, there's this process called conjoint analysis. How, how many of you have ever heard of conjoint analysis? Awesome. So conjoint analysis is a method that has been used for a long time for understanding what uh, uh, people's preferences often in consumer products are without actually having to make a bunch of different products uh, and without, and to understand essentially what people want without, in situations where they can't really articulate it. Like, you know, do you want a, you know, in your coffee maker, do you want a bigger beaker or do you want it to be cheaper? Uh, well, it depends. But if you do a thing called a conjoint analysis, you can actually understand, oh, people in these situations prefer these sets of things, even though they can't articulate those uh, pre uh, preferences very clearly. And so what, uh, 
analytics done to consumer products in this situation can do is they can essentially apply that kind of math, apply that kind of methodology to everything, to chairs, to pencils, to cars, to skyscrapers, whatever. Um, and uh, although probably not skyscrapers in the, uh, the model that I'm thinking, which is much more of a consumer product model. Um, because the next piece of it is social commerce. So social commerce creates sales channels that allow you to sell small numbers of products, pre-sell them, you know, uh, uh, to see how much interest there is. And allows you to find niche markets and allows uh, people to market to each other. And finally, cloud-based design tools allow designers and engineers to collaborate on the distributed development of physical products. So this is the complete ecosystem. So it's a world, you know, complete in you know, the, the, the framing of this presentation, right? A world where design directly drives creation and where data informs design. So this is a world, in my view, there's a lot of really interesting benefits and a lot of interesting implications that happen out of this. Because this is a world where products are made in small numbers only when they're requested. You don't make extra stuff. They're made locally because you can distribute the manufacturing with local materials and local workers. So you're not overemploying here, underemploying there. Um, however, you can use the design and engineering talents from anywhere on Earth to design and make the things. So in other words, what a system like this does is it uses the best qualities of both atoms and bits. Atoms are everywhere. There's lots of atoms in the world. Bits, they travel really fast. So you, use, you combine those two, uh, uh, those two things, and you get this really interesting thing where the bits travel to the atoms. The atoms don't have to travel to the people. Designers in this vision play a key role because they are the people that create the hypotheses that these atoms are then formed into. They create the hypotheses that are, uh, 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 get put up against the actual market. And that becomes a toolbox. That can become as a tool in their toolbox of design methodologies. That tight loop becomes something that bec uh, becomes part of the everyday practice of design of physical products like it is digital products. So in the kind of, for me, in the full fever pipe dream, this means that we use fewer natural resources. We take full advantage of people wherever they are. We create only products in large quantities when people need them. We meet the needs of tiny niche audiences. And we take advantage of the infinite variety implicit in digital manufacturing. So I'm going to try to actually act on this. Like, that, that, was, that was a great thing to, for me to kind of uh, uh, come up with. But uh, a couple months ago, I said, like, let's just do it. Like, if, if I believe in this, if we believe this, let's do it. So uh, I'm trying to make this kind of as my focus as an entrepreneur. So um, we just did the first iteration. Uh, when, did, when did it land? A uh, month ago? A month and a half ago? We uh, got our uh, first iteration of a product funded uh, through Kickstarter uh, that we hope uh, we will uh, uh, be able to uh, make uh, interesting and different as we iterate on it. Uh, it is, uh, I'll tell you what it is, it's the world's best indicator light. It's a highly configurable USB LED that gives you peripheral awareness of things that are happening on the net and on your local machine. You can pre-order one right there. Um, however, this is my experiment. You know, Thingum is kind of my laboratory for experimenting with, uh, with, uh, uh, with ideas. We're still, you know, we're a virtual three-person company that nobody uh, is, is doing full-time. Um, and so, and moreover, I don't actually expect that I'm right about a lot of this stuff or that I'm going to be able to do it by myself. So for this, and since I have a group of both designers and geeks uh, in front of me, I uh, uh, posit to you that I need your help. Tell me what I do not know, where I'm wrong. Tell me, after this is done, who I should talk to, where the opportunities are, because I think, and I've really talked myself into this, I think that this will change the world. And I really want to change the world. And I would like 
people to help me change the world. Thank you. Let's do uh, some questions for Mike. All right. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Behind the pillar. Uh, can you can you re repeat that? How do you feel about providing powerful analytical tools to the common user? Uh, I think that would be uh, great. I think I think people should be able to uh, understand uh, what the parameters are that are um, under uh, under discussion. I think people should uh, have access to their own information and be able to man uh, manipulate it. I think that about you know. Twitter as much as I do about th this kind of thing, you know. Uh, Twitter knows a lot more about you than you know about Twitter or about yourself. No, not any more than uh, 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 right now, you know. I think, I think that, uh, um, I think that the problems of understanding uh, the larger implications of our actions on the net in terms of uh, uh, kind of our data uh, traces and kind of our information shadow are so untapped, they're going to be a lot bigger than what did I buy. So, uh, back there. Uh, I, I, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> So you're insulting me in front of this audience and you expect me to take your question seriously? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> and 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 you have decided <laughs> Well, it's going to be hard. I'm a little biased now. <laughs> Um, well, my, po uh, my point is, is that designers develop the hypotheses which they test. They do not ask other people to do those designs. They uh, are uh, essentially saying, I am a designer who is an expert. I understand the principles and the constraints of the design space to the best of my ability. I suspect that this particular design decision is one that is going to be more successful within the context of the work that I'm doing than the previous one or a different one. And then they test that hypothesis. They test that hypothesis against the actual behavior that people have. And I suspect that that does not actually take away their agency as designers. That does not take away their ego, as I believe you are afraid of. That's not what I'm saying. I think we should go on to another question because I think you're com profoundly misunderstanding my point. My question maybe is somewhat related. It's about uh, validation. Yep. So you mentioned market validation, and uh, there are a lot of examples and all of how that works well on the web. Um, what is your vision for some kind of a delivery metric for market validation? 
So this is why I talk about Amazon. So one, one of the interesting things about Amazon is that Amazon as an entity is very quickly moving out um, uh, to the periphery of large uh, population centers. Amazon is uh, doing, a, uh, we were just talking about this earlier, uh, uh, they're gonna be delivering stuff same day. And what that does is they're uh, trying to essentially compete with brick and mortar stores everywhere and kind of undercut them, which is terrible. But at, this, uh, at the same rate, what it does is it, uh, is it creates the opportunity for there to be a nearly instant delivery of specific products, which gives you the, uh, uh, the data back that uh, I'm talking about in terms of validation. Does that answer your question? So the point of sale is still web-based, but you just said... Sure, yeah. Well, it's, it's digital based. I mean, the, 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 the web, I'm talking about eight years from now, you know, the web is embedded into every device and every surface because it becomes kind of the, the water the, uh, uh, that's everywhere. I mean, you already have it on your phone and your tablet and your TV and your, I mean, eight years from now, we're going to have like five more form factors. And uh, uh, it's still going to be, I predict, the primary way that we access, quote unquote, the internet. Yes? In that same, on the same topic, not making winners and losers, but yeah. what's the odds Walmart versus Amazon? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd invest all my money if I did. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, I don't know. Well, well, uh, they're, 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 they're both working hard. Walmart uh, has the benefit of having a distributed network of warehouses known as stores. Amazon has the benefit of not having a, a logistics chain that they are uh, uh, essentially tied into. They, they can be more, somewhat more agile. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, uh, I think it'll be an interesting and pro I think the collateral damage of that fight will not be pretty, uh, um, but I don't know who's going to win that particular battle. It's, uh, I believe. Time for one more. Okay, I think you back there in the corner. Yes. Yes, you. Um, I was wondering if you thought uh, analytics uh, and formal design might factor into your thinking. I think it's related to the general one. Um, I think it depends on how you define creativity. I think the role of design is not actually to express yourself. I think the role of design is to be successful. And, uh, uh, and I think that success is uh, 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 based on uh, uh, meeting, the, uh, uh, the, uh, meeting the success metrics uh, set by your uh, client or employer. And so uh, what that means is that means that uh, you can be creative in as much as it meets those needs. So, and I think that validation gives you a much better uh, uh, way of understanding whether you're, uh, whether you're being successful or not. And that's the point, is to be successful. Thank you. Yeah.